Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Shahani. I'm the senior consultant at KK Hospital, and I'll be the moderator for the nursing track, which will last for nearly two hours from now. Before I proceed, I will first give you some housekeeping rules. The first one, that all the time, the audience will be muted, so you cannot speak to us. However, you can post your questions at the chat box, which is shown on the slide now, and we'll be able to accommodate as many questions as you post to us, time permitting. And the second housekeeping rule is about the quiz. The quiz will have about 20 questions. After every question, you will be given 30 seconds to key in your answer, which will be one of the answers. I'll again uh, go about this uh, or tell you about more about this when we start the quiz. And you will be given 30 seconds to key in your answer, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So the today's program consists of two guest lectures. And we have two senior nurses from the KK Hospital to uh, give those lectures. May I have them on the screen, please? The first lecture is going to be role of simulation in teaching anesthetic nurses. And this will be presented by nurse clinician Kauli Bank. Kauli is with us for a number of years now, at least 15 years. And she has total experience of nursing, which will be nearly more than 20 years. Simulation has become one of the key word these days in medical field, including anesthesia. And we have a good uh, simulation lab in our hospital. Based on our experience, I will now invite Yauli to present her lecture to us. And this will be followed by question and answer for this session. Thank you. Your job, please. Nurses. I'm Jolly from KK Hospital OT Services, Singapore. Objectives today is going to introduce types of teaching strategy, define simulation, introduce types of simulator and simulation, share the examples of simulation conducted in OT services, discuss on benefits and challenges of simulation and the future of teaching simulations. There are many teaching strategies such as lectures. Lectures is the lecturer who decides what knowledge he or she will convey to the learners. As for problem-based learning, it is student-centered approach. Hospital-based clinical experience such as on-job training can learn from your own experience or from someone else's experience. Peer-assisted learning basically refers to a preceptor shape and body shape. Multimedia computer-based learning, such as e-learning, the learner can decide when and where she wants to start and within the deadline. Simulation training is a trend. Simulation as teaching strategy, it is one of the interactive teaching learning methods in nursing education. It establishes a link between theory and practice, provides opportunities to study and analyze critical thinking. Participants can recognize their own progress through debriefing. There are many definitions of simulation. One of it, one of it refers to activities that mimic the reality of clinical environments, designed for use in demonstrating procedures and promote decision making and critical thinking. So when did simulation start to be used in healthcare? The systematic use of simulation in healthcare education advanced in 18th century in Europe. Obstetric simulators were created. Midwife and obstetrics trained with these devices so they could better manage complications of childbirth and use forceps in optimal ways. Simulation in medicine continued to advance during 19th and 20th centuries. Types of simulators, there are low fidelity simulators and high fidelity simulators. Hard task trainer, also known as low tech trainers, it is designed to replicate only portion of the body or the environment. 
such as IV cannulation in a simulation arm. Simulated patients refers to, it can be referred to a role play, which we can conduct to take patients' medical history. Screen-based computer simulators is use available digital technology to represent patients on computer screen or mobile screen. It is integrate, integrated simulators is a combined of computer technology and parts a whole body of mannequins to provide more realistic learning situations. Human patient simulators refer to interactive mannequin which are capable of realistic physiologic response. Complex task trainers involve virtual reality, which represents the highest level of computer-based technology. We have low fidelity mannequins in OT, such as full body female and infants, and the upper torso can use for airway related simulations. The high fidelity mannequins are available in our simulation lab, but need to have trained technicians to support and need high maintenance, it is relatively costly. The three pictures represent our population in KK Hospital. Next, I'm going to share with you types of simulations we conducted in OT services, such as scale-based simulation, in situ simulation. In situ simulation includes scenario-based simulation, multidisciplinary simulation, and crisis resource management simulation. As for skill-based simulation, it can use to train new nurses or for competency assessment or refresh clinical skills for the experienced staff. This is one of the example of teaching new nurses on airway management. We showed the airway devices and the insertion of oral airway, assisting in airway intubation, and extended to difficult airways such as using bougie for intubation. This allows nurses to practice and also to allow them to do return demonstration. Another example is preparation of invasive monitoring. It can be used to refresh the clinical skills, teach new staff, and competency assessments, such as what level should this sensor to set, and how much pressure can it be, and how long they can take to prepare this invasive monitoring. Next is scenario-based simulation. Most of scenario-based simulation were conducted by nursing team. One nurse or APA acting as an expertise. And the scenarios are inclusive but not limited to the following, such as management of patients with morphine overdose, massive transfusion protocol activation, management of patients with anaphylactic reaction, management of patients with laryngospasm in parkour. If the nurse is able to recognize partial laryngospasm or is complete laryngospasm. Plus is the anesthetic machine breakdown intraoperatively. Okay, this is these four pictures actually shows the process when the anesthetic machine breakdown. We have a new resident after intubation, he realized the machine cannot give ventilation to the patients. There's a loud leaking sounds. So our testing to the nurses for the objective is. Are they going to offer anything for the anesthetic to ventilate the patient, such as air viver? For information, our air viver has switched to disposable air viver since 2020. And is she going to call for help? And how long does she take to activate the help? So are they going to uh, prepare a pump to facilitate Kiva for patients to maintain under general anesthesia while waiting for the another anesthetic machine to come in. So the other machine coming, how long do we need to take to set up the machine? Generally, the scenario will enter after this machine has been set up. However, and there's no what if across our, um, our mind during past year simulation. 
Until recently, there is one occurrence that the machine was break down during the elective cases. Another machine was break in quickly, but unfortunately, the machine was not functioning well. So the team had to quickly to find out a way to get the elective operating leaves to be done. After that, the anesthetic nursing leaders did a root cause analysis. After that, decided that the machine part in the induction room have to be checked every morning and make sure it's functional, which was implemented on the very next day. Next is multidisciplinary simulation, which we conduct on obstetric emergency surgery in pediatric OT. Our, in our hospital, Code Green is activated in obstetric emergency events such as crash cesarean section. Immediate threat to life of women or fetus with maternal or fetal compromise. Surgery is needed urgently. In MOT, there are 12 theatres, 5 OTs allocated for pediatric surgery, 7 theatres allocated for adult. What if all the 7 OTs are occupied with Code Green activated? So we have objectives set for this simulation, such as the leadership skills. The, lead, the team needs to quickly find out which is potential available theatre and to communicate with the pediatric team that this theater need to be used for the emergency surgery. And the manpower need to rearrange as not every pediatric nurses can assist in emergency obstetric situation. And how is the team dynamic uh, doing? How efficient is the team setting up the pediatric OT to obstetric OT and that co coordination? such as we need, may need to turn the table direction and we may need to change the pediatric circuits to adult circuits. And we also need to set up the induction room for baby management. As for crisis resource management situation, simulation, the example is a management of patient with malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is one of the core simulations in our OT services, as MH is a rare genetic disease affect metabolism triggered by some of the anesthetic drugs. It is a real life threatening situation. After each simulation, the findings and improvements will be shared during no call. Here is a photo of dantrolin, as dantrolin is the only antidote for MH. We get permission from pharmacies to keep the expired dentrolin in the department for simulation purpose. For safety reason, it is labeled not for patient, for simulation only. As usual, every simulation before, before every simulation, there will be a pre-briefing by the trainer to the team. And after the code blue activated during the simulation. There are more hands, more people coming, more pairs hands to come and help. And there will be a debriefing conduct immediately after simulation by the trainer to the participants and also the observers. Here are some uh, photos taken during the simulation and some improvements deprived from the simulation. This is the very first simulation photo. Uh, the nurses put the image kit onto our anesthetic workstation, which is our drug trolley. It occupied the whole space and also very limited place for us to dilute the trolley. If the nurse stand here to dilute the trolley, it basically blocks the rest to access this trolley. And if someone to come assess this trolley, the, the uh, dentroling dilution will be interrupted. So after simulation, we improve to change the dilution place to a trolley. And you can see this is actually using a needle to, dilute, to, to draw the 60 ml of water for injection and also need to inject into the dentroling bottle, which is very hard to do so based on the feedback. So we 
decided to use mini spikes during the dilution of dantrolene. And if we have more pest hands come to dilute the dantrolene, one bottle of water for injection is not efficient. So we decided to place two bottles of water for injection. So we have two person to dilute at the same time. There's a reminder card placed into the MH case. Remind the team to use mini spikes for diluting of dantrolene. And there's a dose reference. There's also a grab list. So anyone come to the theatre can be uh, directed to go and take our equipment. In this surgery, there is no ice maker. And it is time consuming if from um, basement one goes to level two MOG to take the ice cubes. So we decided to have ice cube in, kept in our freezer and label ice cube for MH only. It's just used to cool down the patient's temperature. We used to use the surgical hand towel soaked with cold water to cool down the patient's surface, but we realized it's not efficient. So change to use Gamgee as the cotton layer inside able to absorb more ice waters. There's a crisis managed file in every theater. After every simulation, if there's any changes to the content, we have to update this file such as olden days, we only have the MH kits in MOT and day surgery. Now we have it in IVF OT and also MRI. In 2019, there's a real case scenario happens. Three years old, three years old girl came for dental surgery without family history of MH. The patient developed MH after 25 minutes of GA. Yet she did not deteriorate further because of early recognition and quick response from the team. MH case was brought in immediately before activation of internal code blue. Internal code blue was activated promptly for more manpower to perform different tasks. Dilution of dantrolene started instantly, cooling of patient temperature immediately with ice cubes. All other required equipment arrived timely. The child's parameters went back to normal range within 20 minutes. And the, the dentist and the anesthetist went to speak to the parents and final decision was to complete the surgery. The child was sent to the CICU after the surgery with intubated for further monitoring and the child was discharged home without any complications. After the case, there's the uh, debriefing initiated by the anesthetists. We realized the team totally overlooked about the child suites. And there are quite a number of bottles centrally has been diluted and wasted. But of course, there are more benefits due to the simulations. So it's always good to take out these dantrolene dose from the crisis managed file because there's a weight range and to guide the initial dose is how much. So what are the benefits of the simulation teach training? It benefits the learners to identify gaps and make improvements after each simulation. They become more confident dealing with high pressure situations. They gain experience with conditions that may not occur in clinical area, improves communications and develop critical thinking skills, improve leadership skills also. Also benefit the trainers to improve on designing of scenarios and learning objectives with repeated scenarios. And we are more confident in conducting debriefing session and establish the improved work process what process after each simulation. Of course, the patients benefit the most as simulation enhances patient safety with optimized outcome of care. We do face challenges during simulation teaching as the OT may be suddenly occupied for emergency situation or air force situations. The staff may be reassigned to assign some other tasks due to scale mix or due to sick leave. 
the attitudes or the perceptions of the learner is very important. And the simulation in future, we will explore using virtual reality simulation for future teaching. As technology advances are the primary factor in the growth of simulation education. Simulation in healthcare education will continue to become more common and uniform. I end up sharing. Thank you. Wish everyone stay safe. This is a reference. Hi. Thank Hi. you, Yaoli, for the lovely presentation. Uh, a well-researched topic. I have a couple of questions popping up. And the first one is, what is the cost of uh, setting up the simulation lab? Uh, well, setting up a lab involves uh, initial stage and subsequent uh, maintenance. Uh, it depends on how big is the room you want to set up with and the computers, the mannequins, and the manpowers and trainings. And after that up, you also have to have the manpower to maintain the facilities, the trainings. So uh, in overall, I'm not really sure how much it could cost, which depends on how you want your room to be set up with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And another question is, do you conduct any training for uh, people from other hospitals in Singapore or from overseas? Not hospital. at the moment. We conduct for our OT services in OT only at the moment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Since there are no more questions, I'd like to thank once again to Ms. Chavli for her presentation. And we move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Uh, Josephine clevel Matibag. She is assistant nurse clinician at KK Hospital and has been with us for a number of years. Her topic for the presentation today is role and scope of anesthetic nurses. So without further ado, I'll call on uh, Josephine to present her lecture to us. Thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues. I am Josephine Clavel Matibag from KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore. I am here today to share on the rules and scope of anesthesia nurses in KKH. These are my objectives to share the learning journey of an AU nurse when she passes out from school, the roles of anesthesia nurses in KKH and describe how the training is conducted and also touch on the job scope of an APN. Here's a brief of nurse history of the nurse anesthesia, wherein the civilian nurses began to practice anesthesia during the 1870s in the Midwest. Sister Mary Bernard became the first nurse to specialize in anesthesia and took over the anesthesia duties of the hospital. And the second mecca of nurse anesthesia developed in Cleveland, Ohio in 1900s. This is Agatha Hutchins, a Canadian nurse who went to Cleveland to work at Lakeside Hospital, and Dr. George Crow chose her to become his anesthetist in 1908. And as such, she became perhaps even more renowned than Alice Magow. Together with Crow, Hutchins pioneered the use of nitrous oxide and oxygen anesthesia and introduced it in World War I open and lead a prominent school for the nurse anesthetist that endured the first major challenge from the physician anesthetist in 1931. Codgins also alone founded the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. And the presence of trained anesthesia nurse during induction of anesthesia is a contributory factor to safe patient management. In KKH operating theater services, we have the following OT situated at different levels. OT at L3, we have one OT. OT at L2, 12 OTs. OT at B1, we have six OTs and one A nurse per OT. 
The role of an A nurse begins with the preparation of OT. We ensure the anesthetic machine is checked and functional, suction apparatus is working, and various sizes of catheters is readily available. Vital science equipment like the ECG, SPO2, and, and blood pressure monitoring is available. Operating table is functioning well. Intubation equipment like ETT, bougies, stilettes, or our laryngeal mask, and different various sizes of face mask is readily available. And scavenging, scavenging system is always on. After the prep of OT, we do a preparation of patient. Upon knowing the nature of operation, we will know the type of anesthesia to be delivered. If regional anesthesia, it will be given either spinal or combined spinal epidural. So we will prepare, we prepare all the consumables that needed. For general anesthesia, especially for a difficult airway patient, then we'll be preparing special equipment like our CMEC, video laryngoscope, McGrath, glide scope, or even our fiber optic scope. For local anesthesia, we might be considering that they will be given a block for a patient. After which we prepare for the equipment, like for complex cases, additional monitoring, we prepare consumables for CPP or the center of venous pressure, arterial line, this application. We also prepare the different positioning aids and appropriate positioning aids and blood products for complex cases always available in our blood fridge. And for massive transfusion, we also prepare and equipment is always ready like our hotline or a fluido. We also prepare POCT equipment like ISTAT, HEMIQ, ROTEM, and HYPOCOM. After preparation, then we, ass we assist anesthetists during phases of anesthesia. Like it, first, in the induction, we assist in intubation, positioning of the patient, intraoperative, and at the end of the surgery, we assist on the extubation of the patient and safely transfer patient to recover, recovery room. And we hand over patient to recovery room nurse using S-bar, wherein S is for the situation, background, assessment, and recommendation as the communication tool. After which we clean and tidy prepare OT ready to receive the next case. Another rule that we have in PKH is the remote anesthesia rule wherein this is providing general anesthesia or sedation outside the OT environment. So KKH anesthetic team provides remote anesthesia to PIDS patient for radiotherapy, MIVG, PET scan in SGH, and angiography in KKH. When in, in, angiography, in angiography, we do cardiac catheterization and interventional angiography. So OT sheet will be sent to KKH and patient will be seen by the anesthetist prior to the treatment. An assigned AA nurse will prepare all the consumables needed and accompany anesthetist for the procedure. Then we'll think about it. How are the nurses in KKH grow? And how are they trained? So we will look into this deeply. We adopt this banners model. When the novice to expert model was introduced into nursing by Dr. Patricia Benner in 1982 and discussed how nurses develop skills and understanding of patient care over time. Benner's model also described the transition of a nurse from novice and from different stages starting from a novice and at novice level is where our nurses are when they join our department fresh from school and from there, they go through different stages of learning till they become expert. Once patient, the nurse is posted to OT after graduating in diploma in nursing, the journey of the AU nurse starts after the generic orientation with the nursing development unit for one month, followed by orientation in OTS for two months. 
where the nurse rotates within the OTS to gain exposure in various areas and learn on the processes. She is then attached to a preceptor that oversees her journey throughout her learning phase. And she will be attached to a body also daily who is a senior AU nurse and teach on the routine and skills, which I will further elaborate. Behind on-the-job training, new nurses go through different components of training, such as lectures, simulation, clinical competencies, and preceptor body. To tap on their theory knowledge, lectures are given by anesthetists and clinical instructors on the following topics, ECG interpretation, management of postpartum hemorrhage, airway crisis, total intravenous anesthesia, and ventilation modes. In the past, new nurses are, were trained on the job and bodying with the seniors who had their own teaching methods, which may compromise patient safety and thus not had a constructive learning curve. However, today, with the simulation training, a more structured program is in place. So new staff will attend theory classes followed by skill training on mannequins, leading to improved clinical performance and increased self-confidence and enhanced patient safety awareness when faced with different clinical situation. As you can see from the picture, the clinical instructor is teaching the new operating theater nurse on the knowledge and te technique of holding and bagging of face masks in a pediatric and adult mannequin before they practice in real life situation. Another component of training we have in our department is the core simulation training in OT services wherein we familiarize and the workflow for malignant hypothermia, LA toxicity, code blue, code green, code green is an obstetric emergencies, which attempt to deliver a live baby as soon as possible within 15 minutes from the time of activation and machine failure interoperatively. And this is done con and conducted twice yearly. Another component of training that we have in our department is a team-based blended learning, which engages the nurses in a group collaboration and simulates critical thinking to solve problems in real life scenarios. It is divided into three stages, involving anesthetist, AU nurse, scrub nurses, circulating nurses and support staff, which, which form in a team. In the first stage, a scenario and questions given for the discussion among the groups. In the second stage, the three teams come together and brainstorm further and present their ideas via Zoom. And the last stage, is the simulation that builds critical thinking in a nurse and gives her the confidence to perform in a similar situation. And after which, a debriefing session with the participants of the team, anesthetists, surgeons, and nurses will be conducted immediately after simulation. So participants are given the opportunity to share on their feelings and performances in the simulated scenario. Any gaps encountered sim in simulation were discussed and rectified during the briefing, thereby improving participants' responses to similar real-life situation in clinical area. So the benefits of simulation improve clinical performance and patient safety. After the entire process of the three-stage blend blended learning, gaps were identified in processes and improved upon and participants give positive feedback on the good learning experience, and this also gives them an opportunity to familiarize with the setup in OT, and staff express more confidence in performing their roles as OT nurses. Other components of training includes competency on equipments, 
And the nurses are taught on the use and troubleshooting on induction, yearly, and two yearly. The body also and preceptor are given a guide on what they need to teach and allow the nurse to practice till reach proficient level. And also, the nurses are required to complete IV medication and IV cannulation courses before they reach the stage of being a competent AU nurse. They also learn on protocols in PACU, such as nurse-controlled anadrisha, where the nurses can administer IV morphine and IV fentanyl using a protocol as a guide. And the nurses also learn to discharge patient from recovery room using a protocol. Clinical competency is continuing learning experience based on exposures and cumulative time in practice. So the new nurse is attached to a preceptor for six months where, the le le where she learns the day-to-day -day setting up of OT and based on types of anesthesia, types of cases. She also learns on the common drugs and care of patient and PACU. Receptor will always see the competency to do a weekly follow-up with the new nurse. But the preceptor is not around in every shift, so we have this body system where the nurses are tagged with the body, who is always a senior A nurse, and with the body, they learn on how to assist the anesthetist on different types of cases and the preparation of OT. Usually for women's AU, three months with the body, and for Pete's AU, six months with the body, because we have a a multiple discipline to tackle. Then once completed all the competency, participated in simulation, independently able to assist the anesthetist and anticipate the needs of the patient, and this usually takes up a year to reach proficient stage and two years to reach expert stage the A nurse will be labeled as trained and competent A nurse. In year three, the A nurse is encouraged to take up the advanced diploma in nursing, wherein this is a three week full time course, provide acquired knowledge and skills in paranesthesia nursing, that enables learn learners to expand their current knowledge in nursing and management research, and clinical skills. In year five, the A nurse have further opportunity to consider being advanced practice nurse, which this is a two-year master of nursing course, a year internship in institution, and currently we have two APNs in OT services. Let's now look on the scope and APN in OT. They need to learn and pass the following com competencies such as cannulation, venipuncture, arterial blood sampling, invasive airway management, oral intubation, non-invasive airway management, Supplementary oxygen therapy, which determine the usage of nasal cannula and simple oxygen face mask. And to strengthen APN role in paranesthetic area, they are exposed to fulfill the following objectives: to be independent in the listed procedures, manage of post anesthetic complication, collaborate with different departments from the other hospital and run concurrent pre anesthetic clinic with supervisor and to order medication correctly within medication order list in conjunction with consultation. An, um, advanced practice, nur practice nurse wears multiple hats as she's deemed as leadership and management because she builds effective teams crucial leadership roles as change agent and promotes patient-centered care. 
a paraprediv assessor because she does a clinical investigation that precedes anesthesia for surgical procedures, intraoperative member because she cares for the patient from the time the patient is moved to OT until patients transferred to the care of the recovery nurse, a postoperative reviewer because she assesses patient pain management, wound care, and the well-being of patient postoperatively. She is also an educator because she teaches the new, the junior nurses and doctors, and she's involved in research for the benefit of patient safety, and she has acquired the expert knowledge, complex decision-making skills, and clinical competencies for extended practice. And these are the scopes of APN in OT. They also do pre-anesthetic assessment, independent in anesthetic procedures, the man management of post-anesthetic patients, post-anesthetic care unit. They teach hands-on formal teaching, complicated case study sessions for nurses and junior doctors, and they also participate in research committees. I would like to end with this note, which represents the collaborative relationship of a nurse and anesthetist, which is coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a progress, and working together is a success. That ends my presentation. I would like to say thank you to everyone for taking your time to listen attentively to my presentation, and I'm ready for the Q&A. for uh, the excellent presentation. Can I have both the speakers back on the screen? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I will first be asking the questions which have been sent for Josephine, and there are a few late questions coming up for Javli, which I'll take up a little later. Josephine, the question which has come for you is, how is the seniority in your hospital decided? Is it based on years of experience only, or common? How is it common? Okay, thank you for that um, wonderful question. Um, experience, as we all need to be exposed on challenging as well as more frequent cases. And in order to anticipate and be comfortable in dealing with these cases, you need years of experience. And performance-wise, is performance is being confident to deal with it and having um, nobody can do it better than me kind of attitude so your supervisor and colleagues can depend on you without any doubt on every situation. And so this passion and interest to learn and your positivity to improve and give all the best to your patient. Thus, experience and performance go on hand in hand to decide for the seniority of our staff. And for the promotion wise, um, it's our performance based on guidelines and um, requirements but it's subject to the availability of the higher post. Hope it answers your question. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah. And the second question for you, which has popped up is, there's hardly any appreciation from the parents for AU nurses compared to the nurses who work in say wards or ICU. Does that affect the morale of the IU, AU nurses? <laughs> Such interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have compliments sometimes to feel good about yourself. But mm -hmm. because we are working where no parents can see on how we care with their kids or relatives, mm -hmm. we understand that we are less appreciated sometimes. But this doesn't affect the morale of morale as an AU nurse or discourage us from mm -hmm. um, to work harder, but instead to, to strive for our best because it's fulfilling that we uphold zero harm to patient and give the utmost care as possible. And on the other hand, some of our colleagues, supervisor, doctors, and anesthetists also, we're also appreciative on what we do. So they give good feedback to our supervisor and they give thank you messages, give on occasions. Sometimes they give us food to share. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it, it makes, it boosts our morale in that way. 
Okay. Nasa isa kita. Thank you. Yeah. All the points noted for future as well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, Jaoli, I have a few questions which came a little late uh, after you finished your talk. And the first one is, do you need to repeat the simulation for the same batch of nurses to achieve adequate fluency and retention? Basically, what they are asking is, how many sessions are necessary to assure competency in the topic addressed during simulation? Your answer, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it depends on the scenarios and depends on the OT situations. Uh, such as uh, for anesthetic machine breaks down, we do repeat it on the day with the same team because we want to know uh, how we could uh, do the shifting and the setting up of the another machine we brought in. Such as we probably can come in from the induction room, but then our 40 machine, how could we move out? And also, we probably can come in from the uh, the main exit door, but intraoperatively, it probably compromise the patient safety, such as infection control. So, yeah. uh, but for other scenarios like uh, multidisciplinary or crisis management, if the OT situation allows, we probably can repeat. But most of the time, we don't because during the debriefing session, uh, the we identify the gaps and the improvements during the debrief. So all these will be shared to our population in the OT services. So it is not really necessary to repeat. Yeah. Hope do, I you do, do you do any competency test? Um, suppose you have done a simulation for a particular thing, for example, like uh, failed anesthesia machine, uh, and uh, say about eight or 10 nurses have attended the simulation and you have done the debriefing after that do you do a written competency test after say a month or two months based on the same topic to find out whether um, they have retained the knowledge gained during the simulation uh, not really because uh, no. we communicated uh, to the teams okay. based on the findings yeah okay and uh, the other question is has going virtual with COVID impacted the way you design your simulation? And in the virtual setup, what is the ideal number of participants versus a live, real, and present situation? Okay. VR probably is our future simulation at the moment. In our OT services, we had not go to VR yet. Uh, the reason such as the cost, because uh, of VR design and the VR equipment and the technical support, uh, currently, we are actually doing is mainly these inside to simulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. If uh, there are no other questions, I can't see any more questions on the chat or on my WhatsApp. So I'd like to thank both the speakers once again, and we will get we'll uh, bring you back after the quiz for one final time later. Thank you, both of you. Okay. All right, we now move over to the next segment of our nursing track, which is the quiz. Can I have the slide? All right, as I have pointed out in the housekeeping rules uh, right in the beginning, uh, after every question, there will be a pop up uh, uh, on the right side where you can type your answer and uh, you will be given 30 seconds so basically the rules are i'll encourage everybody to participate those who are in the audience not uh, limited to nurses uh, every question has four options and please choose the most appropriate answer and that means only one of the four is right not multiple choice and you'll be given 30 seconds to key in your answer when the question has been read out and the correct answer will be given by the moderator after the 30 seconds time is over before moving on to the next question. So I hope I have made myself uh, clear as far as the rules for quiz is concerned. And can we have the first quiz question, please, on the screen? OK, the first question is simple. World Anesthesia Day is celebrated every year on a, 16th October, B, 
18th October, C, 20th October, and D, 22nd October. Your time starts now. All right, your 30 seconds are over. The correct answer is 16th October. This is the day in 1846 when first public demonstration of anesthesia, ether anesthesia was given in Mass General Hospital US. And uh, that's why uh, it's uh, considered as World Anesthesia Day. All right. Uh, I have got the results, polling results, 100%. All of you have given a correct answer, that is 16th. We move on to the next question, please. The intramuscular dose of succinylcholine to treat laryngospasm in children is A, one milligram per kilo, B, two milligram per kilo, C, 4 milligrams per kilo and D, 10 milligrams per kilo, intramuscular. Your time starts now. All right, your time is up. The correct answer is C, four milligrams per kilo. The intubating dose of uh, succinylcholine is about one to 1.5 or maybe up to two milligrams per kilo. For treating laryngospasm, if you are giving intravenous, the dose is much, much lower, 0 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilo at the most. But if the child doesn't have IV access and has gone into laryngospasm and you need to give succinylcholine, then the intramuscular dose is four milligrams per kilo. All right, now I have the polling results with me here. Uh, 43% of you have given the answer correct, four milligrams per kilo, and 57% of you have given the answer one milligram per kilo. Probably uh, the catch was intramuscular, and uh, those who were given the wrong answer probably got stuck with the IV dose. Anyway, doesn't matter. Questions will become more interesting and uh, tougher, if I may say. So we'll move on to the next question, please. The next slide. Pin index refers to the safety aspects of anesthesia machine, A. B, operation table, C, diathermy machine, and D, operation theater light system. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer is anesthesia machine. Pin index was probably one of the earliest safety design on the anesthesia machine, whereby you cannot put uh, oxygen cylinder into a nitrogen, uh, nitrous oxide uh, cylinder space so that there is no interchange of the, uh, the cylinders 
by accident. And the same pin index is also uh, used for uh, uh, even the gas pipeline which comes into the machine, not only for the cylinders. So it's a very important safety device. All right, 90% of you have given correct answer and it's a machine, whereas 10% have written for diathermy, uh, which is not right. Diathermy machine may be having some other safety aspects, but uh, uh, not to my knowledge. <laughs> All right, we move on to the next slide or the next question, please. All of the following can be used in a four-year-old child coming for one lung ventilation, except A, Fogarty catheter, B, aunt tube, C, univent tube, and D, double lumen tube. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer for this particular question is D, double lumen tube. Because in a four-year-old child, we will not be able to put a double lumen tube because the smallest size of double lumen tube is size 26. Whereas the other things mentioned, A, B, and C can be used. So now I have the polling results with me. 100% of you have given correct answer. That's double lumen tube cannot be used in a four-year-old child. Can we have the next question, please? U-wave in ECG is typically seen in the following condition. A, hyperkalemia, B, hypokalemia, C, hyponatremia, and D, hypernatremia. Your time starts now. All right, the time ends. The correct answer for this particular question is hypokalemia. In hyperkalemia, you get tall T waves. Hyponatremia and hypernatremia, um, I, I don't remember myself actually, <laughs> what are the changes on the ECG, but the correct answer for this is B, hypokalemia. Again, all of you have given 100% correct answer, that is hypokalemia. Can we move on to the next question, please? The drug Sukumadex specifically reverses the effects of which of the following drug? A, Rocuronium, B, Atracurium, C, Mivacurium, and D, Succinylcholine. All four of these are muscle relaxants. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. This particular drug came into uh, clinical practice only in the last decade or so, and it specifically reverses the effect of rocuronium, not for other drugs. So it's very, very, very specific. Again, all of you have given correct answer, which is A, rocuronium. The next slide, please. Okay. The arterial transducer accidentally slips much below the level of patient. Which of the following statements is true in this condition? A, 
both the systolic and diastolic pressures will reflect higher values than the actual pressures. B, both the systolic and diastolic pressures will reflect lower values than the actual pressures. C, only the systolic pressure will reflect low, lower value than the actual pressure. And D, only the diastolic pressure will reflect lower value than the actual pressure. Your time starts now. Okay, the time is up. The correct answer for this particular question is A. When the transducer level is much below the level of the heart of the patient, both the systolic and diastolic pressures will reflect higher values than the actual pressures. And I have the poll results with me. Okay, 67% of you have given correct answer, that is A, but 33% of you have answered B, which is the wrong answer. Okay. The systolic and diastolic pressures will reflect lower values than the actual pressures if the transducer level goes much above the level of the patient or the patient's heart. All right. We move on to the next question. Which statement is true for local anesthetics? A. The maximum dose for infiltration for lignocaine without adrenaline is 7 milligrams per kilo. B. The maximum dose of infiltration for lignocaine with adrenaline is 4 milligrams per kilo. C. The maximum dose for infiltration for bupivacaine with adrenaline is 7 milligrams per kilo. Or D. The maximum dose for infiltration for bupivacaine is same with or without adrenaline. Your time starts now. All right, your time is up. The correct answer to this question is D. That is the maximum dose for infiltration for bupivacaine is same with or without adrenaline, which is about two to 2.5 milligrams per kilo. Adrenaline without lignocaine is about four milligrams per kilo. With adrenaline is seven milligrams per kilo. So the polling results have come and let me have a look. Eighty-three percent of you have given correct answer, which is D, and seventeen percent have gone for B. Uh, probably you confused with the dose of lignocaine with or without adrenaline, which is just the reverse in A and B. So the correct answer is D. Can we have the next quiz question, please? The normal value of n-tidal carbon dioxide is A, twenty-five to thirty-five millimeters per millimeters mercury. B, 35 to 45 millimeters mercury, C, 55 to 65 millimeters mercury, or D, 70 to 80 millimeters mercury. This should be one of the simplest questions. Your time starts now. Okay, your time is up. The correct answer to this question is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. And 100% of you have given the correct answer. For that. As I told, this is one of the simplest questions. Can we have the next slide, please?
This is for uh, treatment for malignant hypopyrexia. Dentrolene should be reconstituted with A, sterile water, B, normal saline, C, albumin, and D, 5% dextrose in water. Your time starts now. All right, your time is up. And the correct answer for this particular question is A, sterile water. Because uh, actually it comes, or uh, it should be in the cart. The sterile water is kept in the cart so that it can be used. And again, all of you have given correct answer to this particular question. We move on to the next question. Half done, half more, 10 more questions. A child receives a nerve block with ropivacaine. He develops seizures soon after. The LA systemic toxicity is suspected by the anesthetists. What is the appropriate treatment? A. Methylene blue. B. Fluminazil. C. Intralipid. And D. Naloxone. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer for this particular question is C, intralipid. You have to give a bolus dose and then you have to maintain with a uh, infusion of this particular drug. This is a particular antidote to the systemic toxicity with uh, local anesthetic. And again, all of you have given correct answer. Can we move on to the next question, please? Which of the following drug can cause a new onset adrenal insufficiency. These are four induction agents. A, propofol, B, thiopentone, C, ketamine, D, etomidate. Your time starts now. All right, the time ends. Your correct answer for this particular question is D, etomidate. And 57% uh, of you have given the answer correctly, whereas 43% of you have said ketamine, which is not right. Etomidate can, even a single dose, can cause a new onset adrenal insufficiency and that's how that's why it should be used very very carefully all right not a very common drug for induction agent but it's very cardio stable and that's why sometimes we use this all right moving on to the next question please what is the design that modern vaporizers use a wet wick B, electromagnetic induction, C, copper kettle, D, variable bypass. Your time starts now. Okay, the time ends. The correct answer for this particular question is variable bypass. All the modern vaporizers which we see in the operation theater these days are based on this technique. 63% of you have given correct answer, whereas 38% of you, 37% of you have opted for copper kettle. 
copper kettle is a very old technique which nobody uses these days. So variable bypass is the correct answer for this. Next question, please. Which of the following blood product has the highest risk of bacterial contamination? A, packed red blood cells, B, cryoprecipitate, C, fresh frozen plasma, or D, platelets? Your time starts now. Okay, the time ends. And the correct answer for this particular question is D, platelets. Let me see what results I have got. Okay, 100% of you have said platelets and that's a very good, um, good answer. Okay, so the answer is D and we move on to the next question. A 12 year old child is on dexmetodomidine infusion for fiber optic intubation. What would be the most likely side effect of this infusion? A, bradycardia and hypotension. B, tachycardia and hypertension. C, agitation. D, apnea. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. And the correct answer for this particular question is A, bradycardia and hypotension. That's because it's a wonderful drug as far as procedural sedation is concerned. But the only side effect of this drug is bradycardia and hypotension, which the anesthetist should be, or the anesthesia nurses should be aware of. 100% of you have given correct answer to this question. The next question, please. A child receives massive transfusion in the operation theater. What electrolyte imbalance is expected? A, high potassium and low calcium. B, low potassium and high calcium. C, low potassium and low calcium. And D, high potassium and high calcium. Uh, it's a little confusing for me also, but go ahead. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer for this particular question is high potassium and low calcium. And again, 100% of you have given correct answers. Next slide, please. The normal intracranial pressure, ICP, in a small children, sorry, a question should be read as normal intracranial pressure in a small child is a, 0 to 4 millimeters mercury, B, 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury, C, 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, D, 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer for this particular question is 5 
to 15 millimeters of mercury, that is B. It's more or less the same in adults as well as in children. And 75% of you have given correct answer, whereas 25% of you have said 0 to 4 millimeter mercury, uh, which is not correct. Moving on to the next question, please. Interpret the following blood gas. pH 7.24, PCO2 6060, PO2 96, bicarbonate 23. And the answers are A, respiratory acidosis, B, respiratory alkalosis, C, metabolic acidosis, and D, metabolic alkalosis. Your time starts now. All right, the time is up. The correct answer is A, respiratory acidosis. We see the pH first. Uh, it's below 7.35, so it's acidosis. And then we see that PCO2 is much higher than uh, the normal values, so it's respiratory. So the correct answer is A, respiratory acidosis. And 89% of you have said respiratory acidosis, correct? Though 11% of you have mentioned metabolic acidosis. In metabolic acidosis, you will have low bicarbonate. This bicarbonate is nearly normal. Normal range is between 22 to 27 milligrams per liter. So the correct answer is respiratory acidosis. The next slide, please. In a situation of extreme emergency where group cross-matching is not performed, which blood type is the most appropriate for transfusion? AB positive, AB negative, O positive, or O negative? Your time starts now. Okay, your time ends, and the correct answer for this question is D, O negative. O is considered, O blood group is considered universal donor, and you don't want to give any antigens with it. So that's why O negative is the correct answer. And 60, oh God, okay, only 30% of you have given correct answer. 60% have told O positive, and 10% have told AB positive. Please remember, it is O negative without any doubt. All right. And now coming on to the last question of the day. Which of the following represents standard ASA monitoring? This should be very, very easy. Uh, A, EKG, BIS, arterial line, capnography. B, EKG, capnography, NIBP, oximetry, temperature plus minus. C, BIS, arterial line, NIBP, temperature, and D, EKG, oximetry, NIBP, CVP. Your time starts now. All right, your time is up. And the correct answer for this is B. Uh, we do it on a routine basis in the operation theater. EKG, capnography, NIPP, and oximetry is more or less seen in for every patient. And uh, these days, temperature is also an important aspect where we 
uh, any any patient who is coming for half, more than half an hour surgery is ideal to monitor temperature. And in small children, even if it's less than half an hour, some of us will prefer to monitor the temperature because it has its own consequences in the PAKU or in the operation theory itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking part in the quiz. And I'll give you the answer. Wow, I didn't expect this. Only 64% of you have told the right answer. 18% um, have opted for A, EKG, BIS, arterial line, and capnography. And 18% of you have said C, which is uh, BIS, arterial line, NIBP, and temperature. I was expecting 100% of you will say the correct. But anyhow, it doesn't matter. So now we have come to the end of the quiz. May I ask... Uh, uh, the organizers to bring uh, the two speakers and myself back on the screen, please. All right. Before I end this session, I'd like to ask, uh, first, I'd like to thank both the speakers and, of course, myself for taking time out and making uh, quiz questions. And uh, I'd like to know from Josephine and Dowley whether they would like to say anything. Um, go ahead, please. Josephine first. OK. Um, yeah, I would like to say my gratitude of thanks to my AU sister, Sister Malkit, for sharing her thoughts and um, going through my journey in ASPA. And my OTS, KK Hospital, OTS family, thank you for your support. And to Dr. Shahani and the uh, ASPA committee for giving me this opportunity to share and present on this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yavli, anything from you? Uh, thank you for the committee to uh, invite for this sharing of our OT services training of simulation. Thank you, Dr. Shahani and Carmen for uh, repeated sessions with us to go through and my dear colleagues, yeah, to get it smoothly going on for this session. Thank you very much, everybody, and the participants. Thank you for your time and attention. I think there's two more questions. Are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, there's, I think there's no. two questions, Dr. Shahani. Those two questions were for Javi, I've already asked. So can't repeat the um, All right. How are nurses trained to be perceptor and educators? Okay. Um, for Josephine, yes, we have time, so we'll go with the, this question. In your experience and journey, which has affected you most? Uh, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, you had to choose from the modes of lectures, simulations, perceptorship, etc. Which top two would you pick? Can I not choose? <laughs> Actually, they're all equally important. <laughs> Can oh, I not very choose? Good, answer, very good. <laughs> They're all equally important because preceptor, because they, they will uh, give you a guide and they will teach you at first all, mm. all the things that you need to be a competent AU nurse. Mm. A lecture, because they will teach you the right way and to top up your knowledge. That's why it's quite equally important. And simulation-wise, simulation-based, um, it will build your critical thinking and build your your confidence in dealing with this crisis situation and you'll be familiarized in all it. That's why it's all equally important. <laughs> Thank okay. you. There's one more question for you, Josephine. How are nurses trained to be perceptors and educators? I believe you touched upon this aspect a little bit. Uh, like somebody yeah. wants more clarification on this. There, it's an on-the-job training, on-the-job training, and um, they will send them for courses. Thank and you. Yavli, I can see one more last question for you. What steps do you think we can take to get nurses to be comfortable with simulation training? Um, well, I think it's how the team uh, perceive regarding the simulations, especially during our debriefing session. It is an encouragement rather than uh, criticize them so uh, they can be more attentive to the sessions rather than be negative feelings. Mm -hmm. All right. 
I thought you were going to say we should give all of them a small dose of beta blockers before they come to the simulation. But anyway, uh, that's yeah. your job. <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those who have attended this session or those who are going to see us later uh, by video on demand, thank you very much for your time. And we will conclude. But before conclusion, I will just say that there's a small survey uh, for the conference. Please make sure this is the QR code for that. And please give your feedback on today's program. Write good things only. And uh, thank you all. And take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.